So today also you will be focusing your attention on what is going on inside you in terms of watching your body, watching how the body feels, watching your emotional mood and watching what kind of thought arises in the mind. So in this way, what you really do is you stop reacting to whatever is going on outside. And you also stop reacting to memories about the past or thoughts about the future. Your main concern is to observe what is going on inside you, in the body and in the mind. So I hope you will be able to Continue watching that and it is only by constant watching your mind that the mind can be purified and the mind and body relaxes and you begin to feel the comfort of relaxation. Your mind will be happy, the body will be comfortable. So keep being aware of this, and there'll be a few more that I have to interview today. So whoever is left, we can interview. Uh -huh. So till then, you continue the meditation. When you are tired of sitting, you begin to walk. And when you are tired of walking, you sit. So it's sitting and walking. Mainly focusing on what is going on inside you. Observe the body relaxing, keep your back straight and the head up, and close your eyes. Observe how the breath comes in. and what 
you feel in the body as the breath comes in as the breath goes out you are aware of the whole body there is a question but this paper on which the question is written is also interesting <laughs> it says uh, drug abuse can cause permanent damage to your body and mind Ah, that is also very important to realize that drug abuse also means even taking alcohol. This is why the Buddha has said, Sura mere majja pamadattana, that we should not... Uh, use alcohol and the other thing is that what i heard uh, uh, recently is something that i had not heard before which is that according to the islamic law if you take alcohol you will be punished by the church that is very interesting <laughs> because uh, now there are a lot of bullies who have started taking alcohol all the time which is very bad and uh, so uh, there being a law where the people who take alcohol are punished is a very good law uh, now apart from that the question here is the breath is never the same most times it is long at times when a thought of anger arises the breath goes rapid and short at other times it is not notice what is the connection with our breathing pattern and our feelings and mood so this is very important to understand that although we think that we have a mind we don't really have a thing called mind whether we become angry or whether we become uh, whatever happens any emotion coming up will create a change in the body every emotion is a disturbance of the whole body so this is why the breathing begins to change breathing is also an activity of the body so this is why we should try to learn to relax the breathing and uh, this meditation on breathing if properly practiced you keep the body relaxed 
and also at the same time the mind will be calm and happy. The mind. Now, happiness is also sometimes taken as a disturbance of the body. Some people, but the important thing about this happiness that uh, I am talking about is not a disturbance of the body, but a state of calm, tranquil peace. So it's the relaxed body. So this is why it is very important to observe the meditation on breathing. So as you breathe, be aware of the body, what is happening to the body as you breathe. Because the breathing is an activity of the body. And that activity uh, either makes the body uncomfortable or comfortable. So, this is why it is very important to practice this breathing meditation. If we begin to relax the breathing, relax the body as we breathe in, to relax the body as we breathe out, to let go. So this is why it is so important to practice that exercise we do, which helps you to understand the meaning of relaxation. Otherwise, you are only using a word. You don't even know what the word means. It is only when you do that exercise that you learn what relaxation means. And you begin to understand the comfortable feeling of relaxation, which goes with proper breathing. Relaxation and breathing are connected. So it is very important to practice the breathing meditation. This is why the Buddha pointed out that if you practice the breathing meditation, you can attain the jhanas with the breathing meditation. So attaining the jhana is not doing something. You can't do the jhana. Jhana is to stop doing something. It is only by stopping the emotional agitation that you enter the jhana. It is like stepping backwards It is not going forward, it is going backwards. It's a withdrawal. Withdrawal 
from the emotional world you come out of the emotional world that means you come out of emotions it's a withdrawal that is why i call it ecstasy ecstasy means standing out stasi is standing ek means out you come out of the emotional world by letting go there is uh, in english now people have begun to use that term letting go let go give up to let go is to give up is to relax so it's very important to understand that so any other question you have what's that the mind is the activities of the body or mind is the activities of the nervous system does it mean mind is subservient to body if so is it not a kind of materialism who denies mind other than body well uh, it's very important to understand this word materialism what is meant by materialism you have to that word materialism doesn't mean uh, the same thing as saying that the mind is so all the body you see with the word materialism there is another word spiritualism these are alternate words materialism and spiritualism what is the meaning of that when we talk about spiritualism because the people thought that there are two things the body and the mind so materialism talks about the body that there is no mind spiritualism is talking about the mind so it is uh, but here what we are trying to say is even to talk about uh, spiritualism or spirit is wrong there is no spirit to talk about we have only a body 
So, someone can call it materialism in the sense that there is only matter. There is no mind. So, matter uh, but there is also this idea that uh, When we talk about uh, science, science is mainly dealing with two things, matter and energy. Matter and energy. So when we talk about matter, we are talking about something that occupies space and time. Matter is something that occupies space and time. And when we talk about energy, energy is really an activity. Energy is seen as an activity. Now, even the activity, although energy is an activity, energy can also be in two forms. That is called static and dynamic. So energy can be in a static form and a dynamic form. But they are not really things that exist like matter. It is an activity and the activity at rest. It is something like that. So if we go into that, you have to go into physics and mathematics and all kinds of things, but we don't have to get into that too much. But the important thing is that when we talk about materialism, we are mainly talking about matter and energy. And uh, also, when we talk about spirit, what are we talking about? The spirit is something which is sometimes looks like uh, energy, but it's not real energy. It is only an idea. So this is why we are talking about uh, the 
something that we know and that is the body and the activity of the body and when we talk about the nervous system what are we talking about you have to understand something about biology that is another branch of science called biology that is about the body and in this body well very difficult to talk about this but the body is made up of what are called cells a small part of the body is a cell that is important to understand what we mean by a cell all our parts of the body they are made of cells like if we think of a wall made of bricks so the bricks are like the cells so our body there are these various uh, muscles in the body and so the muscles are made of tissues and the tissues are made of cells but what is the beginning of a cell ultimately even the cell is a collection of molecules and the molecules are made of atoms and the atoms are also now made of subatomic particles so this is why people <laughs> try to analyze these subatomic particles in the form of protons and neutrons and things like that and ultimately they found that even the particles begin to behave like waves so in other words matter becomes energy and energy becomes matter so ultimately they can't even distinguish between matter and energy this is what is called the modern problem the modern problem <laughs> is that we are not even able to talk about two things called matter and energy it is the same thing so you see is very important this modern thing called quantum mechanics or quantum physics this is talking about these subtle things 
but the important thing is when we talk about a mind there is no separate entity in this body called a mind today the modern scientists uh who are doing a lot of research on the body especially the brain now they have called it uh, neuroscience in this neuroscience they are talking about the nerves and what we call the brain is simply a collection of nerves when we talk of what is called life it's an evolution uh we are supposed to be human beings but there are these other animals and plants so it is very important to understand how the human being came into being if we go back to the beginnings of evolution everything started with a a kind of molecule there are different kinds of molecules made of atoms and a new kind of molecule came into being due to the presence of the necessary conditions everything happens in the world happens not because of gods and devils doing things but only due to the presence of the necessary conditions something happens and that is what is called paticca samuppada and but the modern scientists they call it determinism determinism means that everything that happens happens only when the necessary conditions are present so what happened was due to the presence of the necessary conditions one day a new kind of molecule came into being and that molecule had the ability to create new molecules of the same kind same kind of molecule by absorbing atoms from the surroundings so if this molecule could create new molecules then those new molecules also begin to create other molecules and the number of molecules begin to increase so when the number of molecules began to increase those molecules came together and these molecules coming together brought about 
ultimately what is called a cell a cell was produced now if we think about one of the lowest kind of organism like the amoeba that is just one cell amoeba is a single cell and uh, these cells also begin to grow and several cells combine and several cells combine and form tissues and then several tissues begin to combine and form organs and several organs begin to combine and form organisms and these organisms are a combination of different organs and these combined organs begin to have functions and different functions are present in one organism it's like a machine <laughs> even a clock is a machine like that different parts of the clock have different functions so in a similar way an organism there are different parts of the organism different organs doing different functions and these functions when they are done by different organs that is called a system a system is several organs get together and perform a function that is a system so one of these systems is what we call the nervous system so when we speak of a nervous system it has a certain function and the nervous system also at the beginning there was no brain if you take uh, an earthworm the, the earthworm doesn't have a brain <laughs> you see <laughs> and without a brain the functions go on and then gradually they begin to form a brain and in the brain also there are three parts in the human brain in the human brain now they have discovered that it can be broken up into three parts first part is called the brain stem and along with the brain stem 
you have uh, uh, what is called the cerebellum cerebellum so the brain stem and the cerebellum together have a function and that function is mainly to be able to see hear smell and things like that and also find food and perform reproduction so those are the basic things that they do now if we take the brain of the fish the brain of the fish there is only the brain stem and this uh, something like the cerebellum but the important thing is the fish after some time grew up into something like the frog and a new kind of animal came up called the reptiles this is how they have found and these reptiles are also mainly performing the basic functions and beyond this came up another kind of organism as the evolution took place the animals called the mammals the mammals they have what is called the mammalian brain and these mammals they are the animals that feed the the children with milk they are the mammals and these animals began to have a part of the brain called the limbic system and that limbic system was able to produce what are called emotions the emotions come from that limbic system there is a special organ called the amygdala which is able to uh obtain messages from the senses because in the organism the organism is aware of a world outside through the senses which we call the eyes the ears the nose the tongue and so on 
in the human being we have five senses so but these uh, mammals also have these sense organs and messages from the environment various disturbances in the environment stimulate the senses and the senses react to the stimulus and that is what we call seeing hearing smelling tasting touching and information goes from the sense to the brain and it is that amygdala that collects that information and then sends messages to glands and the glands begin to secrete hormones to the blood and the blood is carried to the entire body by the heart beat when the heart beats the blood is carrying these hormones and different parts of the body become activated so when different parts of the body becomes activated that is what we call an emotion an emotion is a complete change in the body the activities begin so it's very important to understand these things today the scientists have been doing a lot of research on this now as the evolution takes place these mammals begin to develop another part of the brain called the cerebrum and the cerebrum there is a part called the cerebral cortex which begins to think and in the human being there is a part which is called the the neocortex uh in front of the brain and so the thinking in the human being the thinking has the thinking ability has advanced to a high level and that is how uh the human being can do wonderful things like the discovered electricity and they started using electricity to produce lights and now producing even uh, clocks and fans and air conditioning and not only that we have the motor vehicles airplanes and now we have even rockets that can go even to the moon or even beyond and ultimately they have even created 
weapons, bombs, and now they have even created what is called the nuclear bomb. <laughs> and people are now in fear that if a war begins, that will be the end of the world. You see, all these things have happened, but when we read the sutras, we begin to realize that the Buddha has gone even beyond the scientists. By beginning to understand the universe even more than the modern scientists, And he had also powers making use of the mind. So it is important to understand that today Although the scientists have uh, made all kinds of machines, even a machine that can think like the computer, but still crime has not stopped. War has not stopped. Killing fears has not disappeared. Why? With all this intelligence, why are these things going on? Because these things are going on, the scientists are doing all the scientific things in obedience to the emotions. This is why the Buddha pointed out that this emotional part is what is called chitta. It is the chitta that is doing the emotional part, that is the limbic system. The emotions are managed by that part of the brain called the limbic system. And uh, the cerebral cortex is doing the thinking. So in the human being, the thinking part is called mano, whereas the emotional part is called chitta. But the Buddha pointed out was what has to be done is not to obey the chitta. What is happening today is that the mano part, the thinking part, is doing what the chitta wants. You see, chitta is dominating the mind and the mano is just catering to the chitta.
There is a verse where the Buddha says, Chittena niyati loko, Chittena parikasati, Chittasa ekadhammasa, Sabbeva vasamang bhagu. What that means is, Chitta is dominating the world. Chitta na niyati loko. Loka is the world. Chitta na niyati loko. Chitta na parikasati. Chitta is disturbing everything. Chittasa ekadhammasa. Chitta is that one thing. Sabbeva vasabhang vagu. That everyone is spellbound by chitta. Everyone is dominated by chitta. Like being spellbound. So therefore, the only thing is to learn how to gain control over the chitta, the emotional part. It is very important to understand that modern psychologists have become aware of this. It was Sigmund Freud. He didn't use words like chitta and mano, but he used words to refer to the emotional part and the thinking part, he began to understand these two things, chitta and manu. The emotional part he called the id, id, id. The thinking part he called the ego. Why did he call the emotional part the id and the thinking part the ego? Because he discovered that these emotions are acting unconsciously. You see, now uh, these machines like the clock or even the air conditioning or any other machine, they are inanimate. We, or we have the word called inanimate. That means there is no real consciousness doing anything it happens automatically based on the conditions. When the necessary conditions are present, it happens. How the clock moves is based on certain conditions. One condition creates another thing, and that creates another thing, that creates another thing. That is how it goes. They are mechanical. We call it mechanical. Now mechanical means there is no thinking going on there. So, therefore that is called inanimate. 
they are inanimate. So when we refer to an inanimate thing, we use the word it, it, it. Now when we say he or she, we are referring to people who are supposed to be animate, thinking, <laughs> reasoning, he and she. So he saw the emotional part as something inanimate. So he used the word it, but he used the Latin word id, id. id, id is it, it in English. So he used the word id. But when he spoke of the mano part, which is the thinking part, which is done by the cerebral cortex, the thinking part. He called the ego. Ego means the self. That means it is like he and she. So he thought that is the animate part. The thinking part, he thought of as something that is conscious and doing thinking. Whereas the emotional part is unconscious. But he also saw that even the thinking part is mostly <laughs> unconsciously done that even our thinking is to a great extent unconscious. That is why he spoke of this uh, unconscious. And to explain the unconscious, he used the analogy of a, a piece of ice, uh, ice, um, Huh? What's that? Iceberg. Huh? Iceberg. Iceberg. Yeah. He used the iceberg. It's like uh, we put a block of ice on the water eh, or something. It floats. So the iceberg is a huge block of ice floating in the ocean. So what he pointed out was that when that block of ice is floating in the water, a greater part of the block of ice is under the water and only a small part is seen at the top. So in the same way our mind the greater part of the mind is unconscious and only a small part is conscious. Now his problem was how to gain control over these emotions. He saw that it is very important to gain control over the emotions that we must somehow control the emotions because normally people are being dominated by the emotions. He was aware of this. But he thought we can never get rid of emotions because emotions 
are things that come from the body itself. It is the body that contains all the organs necessary for the emotion to arise. And therefore, we cannot get rid of the emotions. That is what he saw. So he thought the only thing that we can do is what he called sublimation. Sublimation means to direct the emotional impulse in a socially acceptable channel. Sublimation. So that was all that he could do. And only when we have been able to sublimate the emotions that we become what are called civilized people. Huh? <laughs> a civilized person is a person who has sublimated the emotions. So he had to write a book where he called it Civilization and its Discontent. That means a civilized person is an unhappy person. Why? Because that person cannot satisfy his desires. You see, these human beings, like other animals, they are not only getting angry and things like that, but they have also desires. A man will want not just one woman, they might want several women, and women also may be wanting the same way. But the problem is if you are civilized, you are supposed to marry only one woman. <laughs> but this is why... <laughs> Uh, the Muslims are supposed to have several women, no? but the, whatever that is, the problem is to be civilized is to gain control over the emotions. You see, that is the problem. So the civilized person is not really happy because he has to gain control over the emotions. And even if you are angry about with someone, you can't kill. Now, if you go and do a job and the boss says something to you which you don't like, you can't fight with the boss. If you fight with the boss, you'll be thrown out of the job. So it's very important to gain control over your emotions. And the people who gain control over the emotions become unhappy people. <laughs> this is the problem. Not only that, even if you get married, 
at the beginning you like your wife or husband at the beginning but after some time you begin to see <laughs> that the husband or wife is doing something else that you don't like then you begin to fight and quarrel and sometimes people divorce you see all this is because you're not always satisfied and you become unhappy you see the important thing is that freud could not ultimate to get rid of the emotions you know an interesting thing happened when i went to united states in 1970 i was asked to talk to the american people and i had to talk to some american people who were listening i told them that the buddha is a person who has given up completely eliminated lust hate and delusion lobha dosha and moha a man who was listening to me laughed I asked why are you laughing you are talking about something that is impossible because according to freud you cannot get rid of emotions you see <laughs> unfortunately at that time i didn't know enough psychology to answer that question <laughs> but, but then later i studied psychology and began to realize freud was talking about this at the beginning of the 19th century now i i became a monk during 1960s and during the 1960s a new kind of psychology came into being and that is what is called cognitive psychology and these cognitive psychologists they began to realize that there was a method of gaining control over emotions that is the important thing and what was that method they pointed out that they they also saw this same problem what is that the mano and the chitta now what uh, sigmund freud called the id and the ego these people call the ego the cognitive part and the emotional part they called the affective the cognitive and the affective and they pointed out that the emotions are excited only according to the way the cognitive part or the mano interprets circumstances you see i told you some time back a few days ago that we are born with five senses and the five senses are seeing hearing smelling tasting touching 
But all that goes to the brain and it is the brain that begins to think and that is the mano part. And according to the way you think and interpret your what is going on there, the emotion is aroused. So the emotion is based on the way you interpret your circumstances. And therefore, if you change the way you interpret your circumstance, the emotion is not aroused. Although the body has all the organs necessary for the emotion to arise. Now uh, today the psychologists are talking about this, the, the scientists are talking about this. Now uh, we spoke of this thing called the amygdala, which is obtaining information from the senses and then sending messages to the glands to produce hormones and then uh, that leads to the emotional excitement. But they have also discovered that from the senses, when the message goes to the amygdala, another message goes to the brain from the senses and the brain begins to think but the only problem is the message going to the amygdala is quicker than the message going to the brain and the brain before before the brain is able to act the amygdala has aroused the emotion but still, when the brain begins to think and understand, there is nothing to worry. It's like, say, supposing some big sound we hear outside and we get excited. Oh, what happened? And, but then, when you begin to think, oh, it is only thunder. The, it's going to rain and it was thunder. There's nothing to worry about. So it's like that. You see, today, something like that happened to me. You see, I was uh, after, after we had lunch, or before lunch, I think, somehow I was in my, my room there and big noise coming up as if um, something is breaking down in the house. So uh, I got up and... Uh, looked at the wind out of the window what is going on they are breaking the that roof there so <laughs> i thought what is something is happening here so but then later i began to realize that they are doing some repairs here there is nothing to worry about. But still, because that uh, message goes from the uh, outside, because I heard the noise, and I got excited about this. But then, later when I started thinking about it, then I began to realize there is nothing to worry about. So it's a, something similar happens and uh, so this is why 
today the scientists are becoming aware of these things and uh, there is a story uh, in the sutras where you know sari putta and moggallana were the chief disciples of the buddha and sari putta he was the chief disciple and he had a brother and the brother was now meditating and the, the sari putta was also there near him and uh, they were in a some kind of cave rock cave and uh, some uh, animal like a spider fell on to this brother he was meditating and uh, bit the brother so we, we, when that happened the brother knew that he, he was beaten and not only that that he is going to die so he said well now an animal fell into my body and now the i am going to die so uh please do whatever is necessary and i am ready to i'm ready to die and then sariputta saw the man said oh i am very happy you have become an arahant <laughs> because he is not emotionally excited about this <laughs> so before he died he became an arham so he, he was happy and uh, but uh, so he died so this is a very similar thing that uh, we hear of and there was another instance where the there was a, a teacher who was uh, uh they were teacher and the student both were meditating and uh, although the teacher was meditating the student became an arahant before the teacher stoda became an arahant before the teacher and now the student saw that the teacher has not become an arahant so now the student wanted to help the teacher so he can't go and say oh you are not an arahant then uh, i can teach you and the student can't do it so what he did was he went to the teacher and said you have uh, progressed in your meditation and uh, you have certain psychic powers and uh, can you create an elephant so he said ah okay i can create an elephant and he created an elephant so uh, then he said okay now make the elephant rush towards you <laughs> so he made the elephant to rush towards and then he got frightened then he said ah you are frightened <laughs> yeah because 
then he realized that he was not an arahant because the arahant won't become frightened like that. So then he said, okay, uh, I told you this to make you realize and uh, so this is what you should do and uh, and then he uh, told him how to uh, meditate and become an arahant. That's the main thing. So these are also instances where we get this idea of uh, the message going in two directions. You see, one message goes to the amygdala and the emotion is aroused and the other message goes to the brain where the thinking goes on and uh, then uh, you begin to change the way. And now they are talking about this. So it's very important to understand that uh, the Buddha has gone even beyond this. Uh, and if we, if we see the first verse in the Dhammapada, They are in the first verse in the Dhammapada. What you get is Mano Pubbangama Dhamma, which is wrongly translated today. There, Mano means the thinking part. I told you there are two things the thinking part and the emotional part, which is called Chitta. Mano Pubbangama means the thinking part comes first before the emotional part. So it is by changing the thinking part, which is what is called the cognitive part, that the affective can be controlled. So it is the thinking part that is able to control. And that is the real secret discovered in the modern world by the cognitive psychologists. They are using that in what is called cognitive psychotherapy. They are using that principle, but still they are not able to fully control the emotions because they don't know about meditation. And uh, But the Buddha use this method and that is what we are using in this book if you read this book here the buddha is i am talking about this that what is called the seven steps to awakening sapta bojanga the sapta bojanga is really using that same principle and that is how the emotions are completely eliminated and that elimination of the emotion this is not understood by all the modern meditators who talk about vipassana bhavana and all that they are unaware of this. This is why this message that I am talking about is a very important message. That this has to be conveyed to the world. And that is how our friend is now uh, uh, <laughs> prepared to <laughs> uh, do these things that we will be able to somehow convey this message to the world that uh, the Buddha, how he eliminated all emotions, loba, dosa and moha, lust, hate and delusion, completely eradicated. He was able to do this because of this sapta bojjhanga, based on the principle 
that you get in the first verse in the Dhammapada. And that is very important to understand this and that is how we are able to get rid of these emotions completely. And so you can learn this meditation and begin to ultimately somehow uh, reach some stage even if you can't read that stage in this life, even in a future life you might be able to. The important thing is to learn this properly and practice it and also speak about it to the others in the world. So the, the, the modern um, uh, Sangha or the monks who are even going to other countries and trying to talk about Buddhism, they have to learn this. Today, most people who talk about Buddhism don't know about this. This is a problem. So it is very important to spread this message to the world. And today, a lot of people in the West are getting interested in Buddhism. And they are also doing research and they are doing, practicing this uh, meditation. And it is very important for all these people who are interested, they should learn this. And we have to spread this message. So I hope you understood and we have come uh, almost to close to four o'clock. So continue the meditation in this way. Now the time has come, what is called the tea time. <laughs> so... <laughs> Yeah, there is one question here. <coughs> Did Freud speak about superego? Yes. Uh, so there were three things that the that Freud spoke about: ego. Uh, it and the superego. What he called the superego is really the conscience. Conscience means uh, when you were children, uh, there was uh, someone looking after the child, like the babysitter. And uh, this child begins to do things that should not be done. And the babysitter will say, don't do that. So there are two things, do's and don'ts that the babysitter has been telling. And these things get into the mind of the child and uh, after some time when the child grows up, that memory is carried into the adult life also. And therefore, whenever the person does something wrong, that person begins to feel guilty. That feeling of guilt comes from that. So the Buddha has been speaking about that also. That is what he called Hiri Ottapa. 
ಹಿರಿಯೋತ್ತಪ್ಪ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಹಿರಿಯೋತ್ತಪ್ಪ ಹಿ ಪೌಂಡೆಡ್ ಔಟ್ ದಟ್ ಇಟ್ ವಾಸ್ ನೆಸೆಸರಿ ಬಿಕಾಸ್ ಇಟ್ ಮೇಕ್ಸ್ ಯು ಫೀಲ್ ಗಿಲ್ಟಿ and you are reminded uh of doing the right thing so that is he, the buddha called hiryottapyang danang that means it is a wealth that people carry now there are some mothers who don't discipline the children so if a child sometimes some of these uh, poor people when the child uh, steals something and brings it home the mother says ah very good you have brought something <laughs> yeah recommend in that so that means that child is not developing the conscience properly so developing the conscience is something very important that the mother so whoever looks after the child must uh, teach the child what is right and wrong what is good and bad so that is what is called the super ego which the christians call the promptings of god that means uh, they don't see it as something coming from childhood they they try to say that it is what god has given but uh, freud pointed out that that is not coming from a god it is coming from your babysitter who is looking after the child especially the mothers and other elders so uh, that is the meaning of that and uh, but the important thing is that what we really consciously do is the id and the ego and uh, is very interesting to know that uh, the buddha has been speaking about when freud was talking about these three things id ego and the super ego the buddha was talking about the three things plus another thing four things that is uh, chitta mano hiryotap and also the notion of self that we carry the notion of self these are called the upadana four upadanas uh the four upadanas the word upadana is also important because the buddha pointed out that the upadana is uh, 
पर्सनलाइजिंग उप आदान उप मींस इनसाइड आदान मींस टू टेक इनसाइड टू टेक इनसाइड इज टू से दिस इज माइंड टू से दिस इज माइंड इज उपादान पर्सनलाइजिंग दैट मींस people tend to personalize the id the id or the chitta when they are angry they can personalize the anger and say this is my anger and i want to kill this person or my enemy that is you are personalizing the anger when you personalize it then it becomes powerful but instead of personalizing the id what the what freud pointed out was to personalize the ego that is why the ego was called the self self is to personalize the ego that is the cognitive part is personalized so freud pointed out that if you want to make the cognitive part dominate your mind then you should personalize the cognitive part so freud was aware of the importance of personalizing the cognitive part and the emotional part the chitta which he called the id he called it the id because it is neuter gender and therefore it is not personalized so he knew about the importance of personalizing but what the buddha pointed out was you should not personalize the id or the ego or even the super ego you have to give up the idea of self completely it is only by giving up the idea of self completely that you stop personalizing altogether it is by stopping the personalizing altogether that you can bring all suffering to an end so it is very important to understand that the buddha wanted us to realize that there is no self here at all and the idea of self itself is creating the problem so uh, 
Now the important thing is that is why the buddha said the suffering is due to personalizing panchupadana khanda dukha pancha upadana khanda is the personalizing upadana is personalizing you are personalizing five things rupa vedana sanya sankhar vinyan that is your personalizing the process of perception so he analyzed the process of perception by pointing out it is important to understand the process of perception that means we begin to when we see something what we see is simply color because light comes in the form of electromagnetic waves and the electromagnetic wave is detected as a color and this color is what is called sanya and the color can be pleasant or unpleasant or neutral that pleasant unpleasant neutral feeling is vedana and then we make use of the colors to create an image that creating of the image is sankar and the image created is rupa so the rupa is created by vedana and sanya and the process of construction which is sankar which is identified as something like a face or a tree or a flower or a leaf whatever we call it we identify something by giving it a name so there is the image and the name which we call nama and rupa nama is the name rupa is the image some people mistranslate this as rupa is the body and nama is the mind that's not correct rupa is the image and nama is the name so what that is only when you use the eye but in addition to the eye perception 
we also make use of other perceptions like hearing the sound smelling with the nose tasting with the tongue and touching with the hands when we do that we are not only seeing an image we begin to see it as something solid or liquid something that exists in space and time that is existence bhava we are producing something that exists that solid that we see as existing the so producing that object is what is called passa passa is not contact passa is producing the object you are producing the object by making use of the five senses and once the object is produced then the vedana comes into play and they therefore you begin to desire what is pleasant hate what is unpleasant and you don't what is neither pleasant nor unpleasant you let it be you only see that it is existing there the object is seen to exist that is all that is bhava that is that desire and hatred and notion of existence is what is called lobha dosha and moha Loba is the desire, dosa is the hatred, and the notion of existence is the moha. So when you react in that way, you are creating a, what is called the dichotomy. that means you divide your experience into a subject and an object your reaction is becomes the subjective process and the object becomes the objective so the subjective process you say this is mine the desire is mine the hatred is mine so when you you personalize the subjective process so what you personalize becomes yourself what is mine becomes myself by personalizing you are creating a self but that self you point to 
in other words you are trying to find an objective self to point to when you point to something it becomes an object and that objective self becomes your body so it is your body that occupies space and time as an object and that you call myself so the body is called myself that is what is called sakkhay ditti sakkhay ditti means your body is taken to be yourself but the body is made up of those five parts of the process of perception rupa vedana sanya sankhara and vijnana panchu padana khand the five a constituents of the process of perception so when you have created yourself you have come into existence bhava so when you have come into existence by personalizing rupa vedana sanya sankar vijnana now that thing that exists begins to have a past a present and a future the past of the body is birth the future of the body is death and in between birth and death is aging so once you have produced a self by pointing to the body you, you the body has come into existence as the existence of the self so the self that exists as a birth aging and death with the coming of birth aging and death you have brought up what is called dukkha suffering soka paridheva dukkha do manas upayas so that is how existence is the root of birth and birth is the root of aging and death and all the sufferings that come after that एव मेतलाटीजी इन दिस वे दट दुख हेज कम इन टू बीइंग 
the suffering comes into being through the process of perception the process of perception ultimately creates the dukkha it is only when you have properly understood this and seen it in your experience that you see that what was created was an illusion and then you awaken from the dream of existence that is the meaning of samma sambodhi awakening from the dream of existence so this is by understanding the paticca samuppada so it's very important to understand the paticca samuppada in this way it is only by seeing that in your experience with a calm mind when the mind is calmed and when you are able to see this that is how you awaken from the dream of existence so i hope you understood now it's 5 uh, o'clock 